Hello and welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. I'm Shamel Jordan, your host. Have you ever shared like a little genealogy tip that you that you've learned with someone and then the next thing you know they are cornering you at a conference and forcing you to stop whatever you're doing and walk them through how to do something. Well, that was my life when I introduced Google Maps and the uses for genealogy with people and they were just crazy about it. And I'm not going to say their names, Emma and Monette, but they just kept tracking me down. They're like, you're going to show me. So I wonder if today, whether or not they feel confident in their skills, but if not, just for Emma and Monette, I brought on our special to get to guest today. Um, and she is a returning, so she's a double special guest, um, Annette Unra uh, Adams will be here tell, sharing with you addressing Google Maps. And of course, we have always a great segment from our buddies, Jim and Michael, talking about preserve the memory and not the crap. And talking about a lot of crap. We have one person that's on our show that has more stuff than anybody that I have ever seen in my entire life. So he is absolutely an expert on preserve the memory and not the crap. So you guys know what to do out there. I'd love to know who's here. So if you're watching, whether it's live or in recording, please let us know where you are and your genealogy group, you got to represent, okay? Because there might be some genealogy souls that want to hang out with you and learn some more about researching their ancestry. All right, so let's get going with this show today. First up, editor and columnist and my buddy, Jim Beidler. How you doing, Jim? And of course, genealogy tip of the day, Michael John Neal. And Michael, like I told everybody, you have, like, I've never seen someone have so much, and it's, I'm not going to call it crap, it's seriously swag because it's just so unique. And one day, I think that maybe someone's going to have a museum. Hopefully, one of your <laughs> children is going to have the genealogy bug. But seriously, what are you going to do with all of that stuff? Like, and, and no, no, before you answer that, I want to know, is there anyone that you look at and say, damn, they got a lot of genealogy shit? Like, does that, do you know anyone who has well, more there's there's a couple of people on Facebook that I'm friends with that I know have quite a bit of quite a bit of stuff too. And I'm getting rid of what I can. I'm, I'm, I'm if I find a relative that wants some of it, I give it to them. I'm not expecting all my, my children to have all of it. You know, so somebody expresses an it, uh, except for some things that are really close, sentimental, you know, to my parents and grandparents, but anything a little distantly removed. If you want it, I'll, you can have it. I'll take pictures and preserve all that part of it. But the physical thing, it's yours. Uh, oh, wow. That is super cool. So, Jim, you have like a house. <laughs> it's not yours <laughs> personally. So I cannot even imagine. You have a couple houses. Oh, my God. You're living in one. And so I can't even imagine the amount of stuff that you might have. Like... <laughs> Well, well, and and uh, the thing is, the kicker is it's been in the house, it, or the house has been in the family for more than a century. So there, there has been a tendency to accumulate and accumulate. I, I've got no less than seven trunks from different family members uh, at various spots in the house. Seven trunks. Wow. Yep. Wow. Yep. All right. So let's see who we have here today. So far, we have Judy is number one today. Hello, Judy in Chicago land. Hey, Juanita in um, Alaska. Nice to see your name here. Hello, Kimberly Bear in what is probably the Midwest Di Disney um, 
Disney uh, Land uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And hi, June Hall from Shaker Heights, Ohio, um, AAGS in Cleveland. So let's go ahead and get started with our show. And I'm really looking forward to this because if anyone knows, you know, how to do what you're talking about, which is preserve the memory and not the crap. So let's go ahead and get started with step one. So step one is to, oops, that's step two. Okay. I don't have step one. Where'd step one go? <laughs> I think step one was take a photo of it. Exactly. Take a picture. So with digital cameras, you can take lots of pictures. It's not like you're going to have a film issue. So make you get make certain you get a good picture of it. This can document it for many reasons. Um, but, but the main reason is that way you've got the picture. And if you let go of the item or something happens to it, you've got the picture. And that's a cool way to share with people, too, so that other people can have have a copy of it as well. So you take a picture of it. That's step exactly. one. And so step two is to learn the history. So how do you go about doing that? Because some of the things are going to be like really old. And so give us an example of something that you learned your research technique for one of your items one thing you could post it to historical or genealogy groups on facebook to see if somebody knows something about it you could even search for some if you know what the item is called you could do a, a google search for similar items to learn some history of it you could even search in old newspapers for a mention of it um as well that might give you some background information on it, what it was typical prices and things of that type so those would be some things to start with in terms of trying to find the the history of the item in general not necessarily your specific item but the the item in general I mean, what it was used for kind of it depends on what you've got i mean it's a photograph you don't need a history of photography necessarily <laughs> but you might have something a piece of equipment, you know, if you're ancestor farms, you might have a piece of something that was out in the barn, or you might have something in the house, a kitchen utensil or something that you don't know what it is. And that'd be something to kind of learn some of the history of a little bit. Yeah, I have, I have an old Victrola that was that in addition to the seven trunks, wow. that was something. And, and I did get curious about it at one point, brought that down uh, to be a piece of furniture in my, my living room. And, uh, and I did, I did look it up, you know, for, you know, what year, what model, uh, to, uh, to try and narrow it down, just try to see, you know, did have some, some value and to the best of my memory, um, uh, th this was in the 19 teens and there was like one year that was really rare that would be valuable. Of course, that wasn't the year <laughs> of mine. <laughs> Very cool, very cool techniques. And we have access to so much more, you know, crowdsourcing, like you said, online um, is a great way to do that. Um, have Michael, have you ever thought, Jim, have either of you thought about going on Ancestral Roadshow or maybe you've been on, have either one of you been on one of those shows? You guys are just. I'm afraid cool my stuff. Cool. My stuff is not worth anything to be. <laughs> yes. Sentimental values. Yes. Worth anything. I probably not yeah all right so let's move on to step three which is to write a story that's interesting so help us out with that well i mean th this kind this kind of uh flows from the whole uh you know gps method uh you know of, of research that you should always uh you know write things up uh, because writing things up, well, it's, you know, it's better on the pres preservation side and it makes you think, it makes you think it, it makes it easier to expose your question, your unanswered questions that you need to try to find out through research or whatever. It's almost like and a even if you don't have a link. Say it again, man, exactly. Michael, sorry. Right. No. And even if you don't, some items you may have a lengthy history of or knowledge about because you 
interacted with it as a child or whatever other items that they just got dumped in your lap when great aunt myrtle passed <laughs> at least that's the story at le- you know i got this from uncle thomas when we cleaned out the house and while that's frustrating not to know any more than that that's better than nothing you know and somebody later knows where at least where you got it and they may be able to find out more or they may not but if you don't write down something it just becomes a random piece of crap that nobody knows where you got <laughs> Where do you guys save your stories? I would say the stories and the images in a Word document. You could even, there's other things you could do too, but this could serve as a kind of as an inventory or a catalog for your items when you're no longer here. Um, you know, if, if you've, for the things you've kept, your family could, then they know the history of it. You know, you, you're gone. You can't control what they do, but at least mm-hmm. they uh, have access to what you knew about the items that you have. Yeah, you're 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 kind of it. I'm going to use the word provenance, which is you know for a lot of these things is somewhat highfalutin, but uh, but uh, still in all that's that that is kind of what you're talking about because like Michael was saying, you know even if it's only that that you know you got it after the death of a certain individual, well yeah you know you know you had it then, uh, and you can. A lot of times, assume that it was during that person's lifetime, depending. They acquired it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can yeah. you can kind of narrow things down a bit. All right, so we're writing stories. I love it. I love it. I love it. And you know what I think would be a great idea, like Michael, because I think this is what you're kind of doing is a blog, a blog post. Yeah. And if you don't want to, you know, commit to a blog, do a Facebook post, you know, write something, right? At least get the started. The thing about, right, the, the thing about a blog is you may have other, re- after you think you've researched it fully or what have you, you post it, what you found out about it, you may find someone else comments that knows more about that specific item. Uh, you may even find a relative, but you, you may get some more background about the item generally, um, if it's an artifact of some type just because of the blog post and somebody Googled it and found your, your write up about it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so after we write the story, we want to preserve and share. So give us examples of how you preserve. And, you know, we were talking about whether or not we're tossers do, when do you toss stuff? Like you can't, sometimes you just cannot keep, everything and right how do you make decisions sometimes it is in, a preserve in, share and pitch <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and in in this step when we're talking about preserve and share we're talking about preserving and sharing the image and the story your your word document or whatever you make that as a pdf file you could share that with individuals you could even um, self-publish a book and put a few copies in various places if you were if you were so inclined but this way you preserve the images and the stories and the items you know some things you're you're just going to have to potentially pitch particularly things that that might have sentimental value to you because you it was grandma's picture that sat on top of the refrigerator forever and you have a memory of that but your kids don't have memories of that. Your grandkids don't have memories of that. They don't have the sentimental attachment to that green ceramic pitcher that you do, <laughs> um, perhaps. And, you know, so at least preserve the picture and the memory of it. Um, you know, and but one way to, if you don't have a lot of stuff, is to, before you go, give some of those things to people, oh. your family members, so they have a chance to create memories of the item themselves which may and their children if they have them so that makes them more likely to share it and pass it down yeah you know i've yeah. got i've got a short little cook stove from my grandma it was probably about a foot tall about a foot and a half wide my mother had it uh, sanded up and painted black and my daughter uses it as something in the living uh, dining room to sit things up plant stands and whatever but it's there it's physically yes. in that space so she will remember it the kids will remember it and there's some attachment to it. Otherwise, it could just be something they found in the back of a closet when I'm gone. And then, you know, there's just not a special it away. To it. Exactly. <laughs> or sell it, you know. Yeah. And I, and I don't know about the rest of you, but I will admit that part of my motivation in sharing is hoping that some karma 
good ah, karma visits me. I love that. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean that you know, I, I guess I guess it's not completely altruistic if I'm if I'm hoping for for that, but because I because I I I I only have two things, two genealogy things that are in other people's hands that I really you know, we give my eye teeth and more. Oh. Yeah, there's a there is a uh, German baptismal certificate, a Pennsylvania German baptismal certificate for one of my my five great grandfathers. I have a black and white photocopy of it that somebody sent to me. And and at the time, you know, it was marked as far as the dealer who who had it at the time. But but the, by the time I got around to visiting that that dealer many years later, he he not only didn't have it, he he didn't even know who he sold it to. Or oh. what, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I went through this guy's pack rat pack ratted out barn and um, couldn't couldn't find anything. So that that I have reason to believe still exists somewhere. And then the other one is even more tragic. Uh, I had gotten wind of one of my distant ancestors' family Bible, a one <gasps> one that obviously came across the water from Europe because because of the because of the the printing of it and the, the entries that are in in the stuff, and and uh, I only learned of it after an auction, so I sent a, a blind letter to be forwarded to the the winning uh, the the winning person winning bitter and the good the good well the slight bit of good news is the person did did call me the bad news is and of course i yeah i tried i tried i tried not to leap out of my throat with what i wanted to to say oh but just well you know if you'd be interested in selling i'd make it worth your while and and he just said well yeah i'll I'll, I, I'll keep your I'll keep your letter, but um, it looks really great on my coffee table. Was he even a descendant? No, no, no attachment to the talk dog. about karma. Yeah, well, that's that. I I I don't I don't I don't know I don't know what the fly I squashed or uh, or whatever that gave me this bad karma but uh, no i mean for yeah. him for being oh, a yeah. douche oh my yeah. god that is so yeah. horrible it's, it's not funny it's not funny I, I, no I, but no i i get it i get it it's, it's bad when yeah. things happen <laughs> all right so let's look at some of you guys swag that you gave that you shared uh let's see what we got here uh i love this and your mom is the luckiest teacher one of the luckiest teachers because she got to teach the greatest grade. I've got, I think I've, my daughter's got another one of these, but this was above her class. It was above her office in her home after she retired. The, this is not old. I, you know, some stuff is not old. And this was above her classroom towards the end of her teaching career. So I've, I've kept it. some other knickknacky things. I just, I, I've gotten rid of, but this was one that was a more sentimental that is so cool because her name is on it yeah and this i i don't have the jacket and i'm kind of glad i don't have the jacket or the sweater because it'd be <laughs> one more thing you know i'm i'm laughing but i'm serious uh, this is the letter my grandfather got for playing ba basketball um, when he was in high school in 1930s um, i do have so, a, i didn't share the picture i've got a picture of him wearing it but oh, i don't nice. have the jacket and like i said i'm glad i'm glad um, what yeah. where do you keep this i've got that in a special it, it's sitting on a shelf in a archival envelope um, okay uh, that's and and fabric you know how you preserve fabric is a little different from how you preserve paper and all kinds of other it's nice when it's cast iron like that cook stove or something. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep it from getting right you know, to, to minimize rust but fabric and paper you've got to be a little more um, cautious with I, I I'm just impressed that that you had a grandfather who went to high school. I mean, I think except for me and my mother, I don't think any of my ancestors went to high school. Serious, my Pennsylvania, my, my, uh, Pennsylvania mother, German my mother, farmers. My mother's parents did. My other two did not. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. 
I love this. This is like some. Yeah. Manly See, this is something there. else that's not all that old. This is pro from the 1950s, and I was I was kind that of surprised. That pretty I, old I to me. Um, <laughs> he would have been probably a junior high, early high school age. Um, but that that was this was a shirt that why it was white. I'm not sure why you let have somebody wear a white shirt when you showed livestock. But anyway, um, <laughs> you it, stood it, out. You, know, <laughs> you did stand out, and um, it's got his name and that on the on the back of it. His first name is on the front above the pocket. What's Reg Ang? He just sold registered, regular Angus, registered, oh, registered Angus. Registered. Yeah. And so is this in an envelope as well? Um, when I found it, this was on the bottom of a box of a bunch of other stuff, and I've. It's it's hanging very gently, but I've got uh, it's, just, uh, it's hanging very gently. It's kept in the dark because you don't want these things to be exposed to too much light. And I've got to decide what I'm gonna if you know if I'm gonna get clever in terms of how I long term preserve this. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Right now, it's I would in this frame form. it. This should be um, framed. That's my suggestion. It's super cool. Yeah, I, 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 and this Jim's got trunks. Uh, this was a trunk I actually purchased this one from from a an antiques dealer. It's got great great grandma's name stenciled on it. Oh it's her immigrant trunk, God. and my assumption is since they didn't have luggage tags, her name, first and last name, is on there, and that's the train mm -hmm. stop where she would have uh, finally arrived in Keokuk Junction I L L S. Um, so that if she and her luggage got separated, the, they knew where to drop it off. Oh, my wow. goodness. Wow. It is painted bright, bright red inside. It was supposedly used as a toy box. The wheels I've got had taken off, but it was a bright, bright red inside. Oh, that is so cool, Michael. That is super amazing. I love that. Yeah, this is this is one of those seven seven trunks of mine. Oh, uh, much, much less decorative because th this one probably didn't move more than 10 miles uh, in, in its whole in its whole life um, because it's it's my uh, my uh, great great grandfather's coming of age trunk because uh, uh, etched into the lid, you can see W. Mockamer 1867, which was when he was 18 years old. Um, and he lived into his nineties. Uh, he, he, he did move, but not very, not very far and not, not a huge number of times either. And so, so my place was the, yeah, that's the, the inside of it. Uh, and you know, in, I mean, this trunk, of course, I would never, I would never get rid of, but a lot of the things inside are probably on the crap side, uh, <laughs> but, but on the left-hand side, uh, you know, you, you, they usually have like a little, a little box, little side box, uh, for keeping documents. And I, I got the, the documents out, spread them out a little bit. Uh, they're all relating to, uh, Wellington's son's death in World War One, when he went oh. missing, when, when uh, he was declared dead, uh, when yeah. he was getting a, a pension of like $11 a month or something like that. So, um, I was wondering yeah. if that was a box or if it if it was a part of the mate of the box or I, if it was just most like a most trunks at least in in our area they have that they have that uh, built in okay uh, you know that that that's that's kind of a uh, a part of the part of the thing that you want to have uh, you know for your your documents that you don't want to get strewn into the to the larger trunk. Yeah, these trunks are very nice, very cool. So um, let's see. I think that was the last one for that. So let's take a look at our steps. And if anyone has any questions for anything specific that you might have, you might have questions on. I mean, they're not saying they're preservationists, but they got a lot of stuff. And so they might have ideas of what you should do. So please. And put see the pictures in. and the stories you can share. You can't share the item with everybody. And some things, you know, at some point in time, that B is going to deteriorate and not be. Because it's you know older than the shirt, but at least I pre I preserved it in that way, even if physically I can't uh, preserve it indefinitely. Digital media should take care of preserving it. Yeah, right. Yes, yeah. yeah. So let's look at the steps for preserve the memory, not the crap. 
Step one is photographic. That's the mystery step. Step two is learn the history. Step three is to write a story. Step four is to preserve and share what you have. So I want to ask you guys, you guys have a lot of stuff, right? And eventually you'll be passing that on to somewhere. And you have stuff yourself. Is there anything that you have that, you know, especially for Michael, you got daughters, you want to make sure that you can say, okay, you can throw away other crap, but please keep this to remember me by. So what would you guys say that you want to be kept to be for you, for your a memory of you? Oh, that's a... I guess I would have to say when they got married, I wrote them three small cards and gave them an item. It was a, there was a family connection to each thing mentioned in the little cards that I would want them to, to keep. Cause that's something I wrote myself. This other stuff I've got, I, I have, but it's not, you know, something I made or created or whatever. Less so I would probably like. say that. Okay. Okay. Jim, anything that you would say, please don't throw this away. Please, you know, keep this to remember me by. Well, I do I do have some uh, old German baptismal certificates, uh, five generations in, in one family line. So those I, I, I'd like to see preserved in some way. Uh, and, uh, and of course, my my commercially published books, I'd like. I was going to say, you guys have your army of books. <laughs> So for me, I um, grew up in a town called Lawnside. It's a very special town. And um, not because everybody's town is special, but it's really special. Um, you can look it up. And when we were kids, we used to be a part of like this drill team that performed during the Lawnside, like for uh, Independence Day. Now it's Heritage Day Parade. And one year they bought us these little jackets and I still have my jacket. And so I want people to keep that forever and ever in the museum of Chamel. <laughs> um, we've, got, we've got a couple of questions. Judy has a question. I don't have a really good answer to. Uh, she doesn't What's have Judy very much. Talking about? She, she doesn't says, have much family. What does she do with her stuff? Um, and that's, that's a question. And then uh, Juanita's question was, she scanned a lot of pictures. She's thinking of giving them to a historical society in the area. The, the thing about giving things to a historical society or genealogical societies is you want to make sure they're identified. You want to make yes. sure they don't um, include things they already have and it will and it relates to the area and that they have the money and the ability to maintain it um, those and those that it's in knowing Juanita I know that I'm um, you know preaching to the choir but it should be in a condition that it's very easy for them to absorb it into their collection as opposed to okay when we get a volunteer we'll you know shove that box in the corner until the, the volunteer gets here yeah so yeah, let's see that we have another question. Cedar trunk and then carved by prisoners in Huntsville, te ten, uh, wow. Texas penitentiary for my great grandfather who passed in 1909. Huge, heavy, and I hope the family keeps passing it along. I hope so too. Wow. I would say to Judy real quick, I'd make sure I'd photograph everything, maybe even upload those images to family search and other sites connected yeah. to the people that are related to the objects. Ah. So you've at least preserved that part of it. Where it goes after that, that's a that's a hard question to answer if you don't have relatives that are that are interested. I don't have a magic button to make them appear, unfortunately. But <laughs> and even but, if you have relatives who are interested now. You don't know about the future so right but no yes. that's good michael yes very good michael and jim thank you so much uh and we'll see you in a little bit <laughs> i love that thank you all right let's get ready for our special guest Hello and welcome to our second quick start. We have our special, special guest. She's our two times special guest. This is her Annette's second time here. Um, let's bring out Annette Adams. Where is she? Here you are. Hello, Annette. It's so nice to have you back. Thank you. 
<laughs> and so, um, Annette, I want to ask you, since this is your second time, I want to ask you a different question than your one minute genealogy story. And I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked Jim and Michael. Mm -hmm. um, if you had one, if there was one thing that you want to tell your descendants, do not, you can throw other stuff away, but please keep this always to remember me and pass along through the generations. What would that be? Well, I was listening in and I was kind of like, I don't know. I'm, I tend to be a purger. <laughs> and so, uh -oh. yeah. So I think, I think if anything, I would write my own like life story and then I would include family history pieces of information that I've gathered over the years through my own genealogical research and then pictures that have meaning to me. I have five kids. I actually have three sons and two daughters. And so, you know, each of them has something different that they like. But to me, I feel like they've already they already know what I love most in its books. So, you know, I, I think just I don't know. I I just I don't really have anything. I'm not really a materialistic person, so I don't know. I'm just like, I was sitting there going, what do I have that they would want? Maybe my plants? <laughs> plants are special. No, in my family, we name our plants by the people who give them to us. Oh, I love so that. Plants are very, don't undercut plants. Plants, but I, indoor I, and outdoor plants. Yeah, see, I get all the ones that my kids kill and they revive with me. I have a rat-tailed cactus right now. <laughs> All right, Annette, thank you so much for coming to share. A, I think it's just a timeless subject, which is using Google Maps for genealogy. There's just so many applications. Yeah. And so today I look forward to hearing your take on this um, for the quick start called Addressing Google Maps. Very, very clever title. Jim comes up with good ones. This one's a good one, too. You must be friends with Jim. Oh, I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's just jump right in to step okay. one, which is to choose a family and create a timeline. So uh, talk to us about what do you what do you mean? Like maybe give us an example. So usually with genealogy, we always wanna have a research objective and we want to pick someone we wanna find something out about. And so usually you wanna pick someone that you can actually find record collections on that might show an address because that's where we're going with this. So you gotta narrow down where did this person live? What records exist that are gonna tell me about where they lived and what they did and, um, you know, maybe some stuff along that line. So picking someone, you know, maybe you even want to pick a family because you'd want to pick a residence to go with that. Okay. So you're going to narrow it down because we all want to do everybody, right? At the same time, just pick one and then you can repeat, wash, rinse and repeat, as Michael says at the end. Right. So you want to just pick one family and create a timeline. How do you create your timelines? We've talked about timelines a few times, but how do you do it? So when I do a timeline, I like doing it on a Word document just because it gets really messy really fast if I do it on paper, because then I have like <laughs> epiphanies as I'm working on it. And I think um, the way I like doing it is I like starting at the top and working my way down just because in a Word document, you've got more paper. It, it seems like you have more paper to work with. At least you can make the font bigger and smaller. But usually what I'll do is I'll start with what I know, like is there a birth, is there a marriage, is there a death? And then usually there's a, an address that's in a, associated with that. And then let's say if a person was born in 1894 and they came to America in 1911, then maybe there would be a 1920 census record. If they were in New York, it might be a 1950 census record and then a 1920 census record. And so basically what I do is I, I, I put in color, the things I know is in black and white, basically black on white paper. And then I do red and blue and color code based on, you know, maybe I'm gonna find records in this area. Oh, there should be census. Okay, okay. Maybe it sounds like you do, your own, do kind of like a manual Gen Smarts, which is that software that you use to see where the holes are. Oh. And also maybe you're, you sounds like a, 
printing out a timeline of specific people like heads of household might be a good way to kind of help create that timeline too from mm -hmm. your genealogy software yeah so. and what I, what I like too is on this timeline I like having one side where I have the data and then on the other side I can brainstorm and I can oh. kind of create a mind map with this whole no thing. that's nice that's nice yeah. let's take a look at step two which is to create a my map in um, your Google in a Google account. So you have to have a Google account to do this, and you'll just Google Google my maps <laughs> to get to where my maps are. And if you have an account Google account already, once you click on my maps, it'll take you right in. Yeah. Um, and I'm, we're going to show examples. Um, let's go ahead and you want to just show some some stuff now. Let yeah. Me, do you want me to show it on my end? I got it. Okay. I, th I figured as much. I'm like, this is easy. <laughs> I just provide <laughs> you with the information. Okay, so here's kind of a, a great, like a fan chart that's from Family Search that helps you identify a person you want to work on. Um, in this case, I'm focusing on Oscar Theodore Halter. He was born in 1898, died in 1979. And, you know, I've got other related information to it. And then off to the side, I've created a timeline of when he was born, where he was born. And then in red, I have two passenger lists. One is a, a departure list from Hamburg and the other is an arrival list to New York. Then I have, you know, an actual marriage date and then I have this death date. OK, so, I'll see how you put in the, you know, this is what we're looking for. This is what's missing mm -hmm. here. And then yeah. it's also like looking for people in connection with the events of that person's life. So I didn't use a census. I think record. I went ahead. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. You're going hold the on, wrong way, but it's totally okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, let me get out of here. I don't know. My fingers are, are going rogue. All right, so you created your timeline and um, you created your Google account. And, and I did my mind maps. Adding a census layer. So, can you explain what that means? Okay, so within uh, Google Maps, in your My Maps um, layer, you're going to be able to create multiple layers and you can name and identify each layer. So, let's say you want to do a birth layer or you want to do, um, let's say you want to do a layer for for traveling, like the immigration records. And then within that layer, you would you would look for all the documents on your favorite sites. And then you would plug in the address to my maps in Google and that layer, and then you would color code them so that eventually you're going to have, oh, he was born in Wilhelmsburg, and then he came to America, and then he naturalized. And if you have each of these layers set up and color coded based on the layer, you can yeah. overlay them all on top of each other, and you can see a pattern. And then well, let's, take, looking, let's take a look at what you did. Do you have you have a screen of, of that? Yeah. So, so this was I, you pulling out the addresses from the various documents? Yes. So at the top, I have I have Anna Halter, who was the wife of um, Theodore, and um, she has her own little record. I would look through this document would have three different. There are three different documents that would have different dates. There are going to be lots of dates on these documents and they're going to be addresses. And then at the bottom, I have the affidavits of witnesses that are going to have addresses, which might be, you know, relatives or somehow connected to my person. And I want to keep track of them, too. And I can create another layer of, you know, witnesses and and see where they live in relationship to my person that I'm researching. And over on the right hand side, I actually have the German registration document of the birth and the address that's been circled and where this is in Wilhelmsburg. And then beneath it, I have a pullout of the information so that you could see, oh, yeah, he's from Wilhelmsburg and his wife is from Bublitz, Germany. Oh, Bublitz. I now have a new piece of information. You know, what would I go use to look that up? And does that place exist? It's now in Poland. And so now I would plug that in because now I have a new idea of where to look for more information about this person. So just pull out all the addresses for mm -hmm. this for the family that you have chosen. And all the dates too. And all the dates too. So here we are in Google My Maps. 
Yes. So this is Google Maps. And then at the top on the left hand side, right under where it says live, you have your places and you would click on that. And this is a screenshot, of course, you would click on that and it will open up your places and then you'll have a listing of all your places that you've created. And then you would go into your map where you would title it and then you would give it the information you want. And this is what it looks like when this is just an example of of the halter genealogy map that I created in Google. I have the title, I have a little information about him and who he was, and then beneath it, you can see the layers. And then this one, I only created two layers. One was for where he was born, and the other is for his naturalization record. And I even uploaded an image from Ancestry of that document that's there. I put the link in there so that I can go back to it. So on the one hand, it's a my map so that I can visualize the data that I'm collecting, but yeah. it's also a mind map to create connections of other people when I'm doing collateral research. And I really like this tool just because you can put these, you can color code these pins, you can put the information in there, and then you can come back to it later and look it up kind of like a research log, but it's not as, it's more organic instead of being linear. So let's talk about some different ideas and ways like how this might be used. So it looks like in general, what people, what you're talking about is taking your documents and um, GPSing them, pop popping mm -hmm. them on a map so that you can see all the places that this person has been. Um, are there any other types of uses for um, Google Maps that you have tried? For well, um, you can use them for um, migration patterns. You can also use them when you have doppelgangers, when you have people with the same name and you're not sure if this person is from the same area and you want to track and find correlating information that will pull it apart. Um, you can also use it for situations where, let's say, birth records didn't exist and now you have these people with the same name and you're trying to create family units and you want to see how they might be related because sometimes you get these outliers and you don't know, okay, is this really my person? Uh, like in my case, I'm from Hamburg, Germany and yet I live in Utah and I have five children here and I have a cousin who lives here. So the chance of me coming to Utah is normal because I have a cousin who lives here, but I'm an outlier if I look at my other relatives who lived in New York. So, so really it's a tool to, to define and identify different, different individuals and family units and do collateral research. Yes, for sure. Let me show um, this other map, this map that you created. I don't know why my, here we go. <sighs> So this map, I discovered I have Huguenot heritage. And so what I started doing was um, based on these Ortsfamilienbücher that I was sent, I started plugging in the locations of where these different families were coming from. Um, we can't blow this up so that you can see it, but you can literally see a trail that starts in the south southern part of France that migrates up through Switzerland and then up into Germany and where all the green ones are. That's where a lot of my people were. And you can see on the left left-hand side, open in my maps, you see the escatons or the departments that I've created where these locations are and they're layered. And as I dig into this more and read through the histories of these Huguenot people, I can look up where these people with the same surname are coming from. So maybe I can actually pull them apart from the 1600s and figure out who my guy is and who isn't. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I definitely the doppelganger thing is extremely helpful with the maps. Oh my gosh. Um, so the census layer, when we talk about adding layers, like it's not crazy important that you do that, but it's helpful when you can separate your, your data. Um, that we already talk about locate records with addresses. So you did that. Yeah. And the final thing is to add the locations to the map, which is what you did. And great ideas i actually have a map that i created myself because i love google maps and did i not put it in here oh here it is um so i was creating a souvenir journal for the family reunion and oh, cool. the town that we all come from 
has changed incredibly. Like it has changed a lot. Um, simple things uh, like where the school bus stops are, um, oh, things like that. that, where the candy stores are. And so I created a, um, a map uh, called Mapping East Berlin, and it's Berlin, New Jersey. And like she was talking about the different layers. So I created a layer of the churches. So at any time I could just see the churches. Yeah. Then I did all where the homes of all of my, um, where my ancestors, my great grandma and all her siblings and her parents, where they built homes. Um, and then landmarks, like where the American Legion is, where the cemetery is. And a lot of neighborhoods have what they call paths, you know, that allow you to cut from one side of town to the other side. And, you know, with development, those paths disappear. And those paths have a life of their own. Everybody could come up with some kind of tale that happened to them in the path. And so I thought it was important for us to preserve that for the people who didn't get a chance to um, actually uh, grow up in Berlin. Oh, and the school bus stops, those changes changed yeah. a lot, but you know, you gotta know where the school bus stops are. And the final thing that was very important for me to put on this map was Brownies Lake. It is this lake that all the baby boomers talk about how they almost lost their life there, right? <laughs> And if you go there, there is like no water. Like if it rains really hard, you might see it, it looks wet. But because of, you know, evolution and environment, there's no lake there anymore. And so I needed to show my generation and the millennials, like where is this mythical brownies lake where everyone almost died? Well, I love that you bring that up because I remember one of my first experiences at the Family History Library, there is a collection of books on the Netherlands of towns that have sunk, like they've disappeared. And so if you're looking through church book records for this place and it's not on the map, you know, having these older maps is really nice. And the other thing that's really cool about Google Maps is that you can actually overlay county jurisdictions oh. or church districts and and even like school districts. And that's one of the things that's always tricky because you can have a school that's here and a school here and a school here. Well, the schools don't move, but the district line may have changed. Now, all of a sudden, if you're looking for records, mm -hmm. you can't look here. You have to look over there. And, and so I think the other idea that came to mind is on Ancestry, a lot of records are our collections are put into um, archives. You have to look by the location of the archive and not by the location of where your ancestor was born. So if you're looking for that person and that town and it's yes. been moved to an archive, you're well, it doesn't exist. Well, no, it does. <laughs> maps can actually help you see that so that you're not lost. Because the reality too is, is we're dealing with places and times that change and and people move away and they don't know or we come back to something not knowing where it is and i also remember another occasion where this person was looking for someone in in hungary and they had a story and they had this amazing story and so we were looking at the location on this old gas online gazetteer and the place that we had didn't match up, but there was another place that fit the description perfectly because it still had a university there. And so those are the kinds of things that we're looking for clues that are visual that help us lay down these facts when the evidence may not be there anymore. And I love that you brought up your your you know, the candy stores. <laughs> yes, yes. Candy stores are huge. You know, like stops. so much business um, commerce going on in our in our little neighborhoods. Um, the other thing is migration patterns like you had shown. I love uh, using maps for migration patterns. When you talked about bringing in county jurisdictions, that is one thing that you can get from like the Newberry Library, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can download those files. Then there's also the fire insurance maps that are really awesome because they can show you houses that may still exist. And the other cool feature on Google Maps is that you can go to the street level and you can literally go down the street. And if those houses still exist and you're comparing them to, say, your census 
layer where you have the address of the houses in 1910, 1950, 1920, whatever, you can now go through and see if that house still exists. And then you can take a snapshot of it. And then you actually are like, oh yeah, I remember this location. I mean, I've had people do that. Or you have other people like, oh, so this is where they lived. And, and it's really cool. Yes, yes, yes. I want to offer, um, uh, yeah, there's so many things that you can do with Google Maps. Um, we could be here. I love the idea of how you can change the icons. Like I, I made like the candy for the candy store mm -hmm. ladies. And the houses. Um, yes, yes. You need one for babysitters. <laughs> <laughs> There's the terrible ones and the great ones, right? <laughs> I love that the babysitter. I love that. And cemeteries, of course, cemeteries yes. are great. I've done Google map using uh, maps on cemeteries uh, where the civil war soldiers were. I created a civil war soldiers map and that's nice and historical and youth. If you want to get youth involved in genealogy, would you agree that this is a great way? Have them going in through documents and yeah. pulling out addresses. Yeah. If they're using technology to make discoveries, it makes it relatable because then it's not just some random information. It's 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 relatable. And I mean, what started me on genealogy was a map. And when I got to discover it on an online gazetteer, that made it that much more exciting. And, and I think the biggest thing is it's really difficult to tell places apart because you just don't necessarily know where those places are anymore. Exactly. Annette, I loved your Google Maps. Let us take a look at the steps with, for addressing Google Maps. Step one, you want to choose a family and create a timeline. Step two is you want to create a My Map in, a, uh, for you, in your Google account. And you want to go ahead and add layers. One suggested layer is the census layer because we get those addresses from the census. Step four is you want to um, locate um, additional records that have addresses and you want to add the new locations to the map. And then step six, you want to analyze and triangulate that data. And of course, wash, rinse and repeat because, you know, do you have all these other lineages, other families that you want to track? And that thank you so much. Let's bring our guys back because guess what? We have time today for question of the day. I was a little bit worried that trunks would be something different like swim trunks. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Where your mind goes in that. Well, I mean, are they like 1940s, 1950s? How are they gonna date you? <laughs> I'm going for oh. some 80s speedos. So, um, what you do in your spare time is not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, what was our question of the day? What is a piece of ancestral swag that you got rid of that you wish you had not? Ah, does anybody who's watching you guys have something that you got rid of you wish you would have kept? How about you guys? You have anything that Annette who's Miss Purge? Is there anything that you wish you didn't purge, Annette? <laughs> Um, well, I've heard stories of other people. Um, one of them was a box of pictures. The aunt was actually blind. She could see, so she didn't know. So they ended up throwing him away. And then another person in my family, um, he had recorded his father and then ended up deleting on a, on a day when he was upset with him, deleting the, the interviews and those information, that information, and he regretted it terribly. And yeah, so I think those are some hard ones. Yeah, I'm 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 pained over here, Michael or Jim. I'm I'm gonna take a whole different approach with the story that it's sad but kind of it, it's funny. Uh, my grandma <laughs> babysat me when I was little, and I was probably three or four. And she you look had like a, a really she, fun little guy too, she, Michael. <laughs> I'm not sure if I was or not, but I had more hair and whatever. Anyway, um, I she had a butter paddle that was her grandmother, her mother's one of the only things she probably had from her mother, and my uncle we all came in to eat dinner at noontime my uncle had said if you misbehave mom is gonna spank you with that paddle <laughs> and so later that day when they were back out doing chores and whatnot and grandma was probably feeding the chickens i got the butter paddle i put the butter paddle in the garbage pail in the kitchen 
And I don't know, a week or so, a few several days later, grandma couldn't find her butter powder, wonder where it was. She had burned the garbage. But, you know, so we did uh, I, <laughs> we burned the garbage and it was gone. And I had said, well, I put it in there because Uncle so-and-so said you were going <laughs> to a couple of things. My grandmother wouldn't have spanked me. I got disciplined, but it was a different, it wasn't spanking. But um, <laughs> I don't think grandma was very happy, but I'm the reason great grandma's butter paddle is gone because I put it in the garbage because I didn't want to get spanked and grandma threw it out because <laughs> I was smart enough. I put stuff on top of it and so she wouldn't see it. You hid the evidence. I hid the ev I destroyed great grandma's butter paddle. Oh, oh man, that's a great girl. story. Yeah, I can't I can't top that one. But in one of those seven trunks in my uh, house uh, was of my great great aunt Sarah's. And in that trunk, there were several postcard albums. And and um, the the long story short is is uh, ended up selling them at a, at a yard sale. And I shouldn't have because they did have some great dirt on old Aunt Sal, as he was known. Because <laughs> uh, they're, 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 a lot of these postcards were ones sent to her by male admirers. Oh, and, wow. And, and, and from dating some of them, you know, we're, we're not talking different parts of her life. We're talking she was jockeying around two or two or three guys at a time. So, so I probably should have, I probably should have kept that one for the comic relief, but I guess you, she definitely, you definitely should have kept it. I, so I am not responsible for throwing this away, but I could have taken action. Um, my great grandmom was a baker and she was an ice cream maker and she used to sell her stuff and her ice cream, no lie, tastes like Hagen dazs ice cream. Mm. And my mom had her, um, had her churn and, you know, wood and it just kind of like rotted out and it was just like an eyesore and we just like got rid of it. But I would love to have had my great grandmom's churn. So, yeah, that's it. So, if there's anything out there that you uh, have of your ancestors, as Michael and Jim say, preserve the memory, not just the crap. Annette, thank you so much for being here. Everyone, thank you for watching. Have a thank great you. night. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you.